Have you heard of the Hoxney Horde? Probably not, right? In 1992, the Hoxney Horde was discovered, and this Hoxney Horde was essentially an old collection of Roman coins and various other items, uh, gold coins, silver coins, bronze coins, some 14,865 of these coins and a whole lot of other valuables that were essentially buried in a field by the Romans probably around about the time when, when Britain as a province of the Roman Empire came to an end. And so for whatever reason, we don't know why, this treasure was buried and then many years later in 1992 was discovered by accident uh, by a gentleman by the name of Eric Laws. Well, when this treasure was discovered and when it was evalu uh, evaluated, it was decided that it was worth about 1.75 million pounds. An incredible find, not only for archaeological reasons, but for the monetary value. An incredible find in a field somewhere in a little town called Hoxney in this province of Suffolk in England. And you know what? This idea of treasure being buried in a field is not the first time that we've come across that, because actually that goes way, 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 way back in time to well before the end of of, of Britain as a province of the Roman Empire. In fact, Jesus told a parable using that exact analogy. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 13 from verse 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and from joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now the question here is, if it was already hidden, why does he hide it again? Well, it would seem that he has found this treasure by accident. The farmer is plowing his field. The field, it seems, doesn't belong to him. He's perhaps leasing the field off of somebody else, which means that technically whatever's found in that field is the property of the owner of the land. And so this man's plowing his field along. I can see him going there with his little plow pulled by the oxen and bang, this thing hooks into something in the ground. He probably thinks it's a rock. Got to get rid of that. Bends down, uncovers this, finds a chest, opens it up, it's the discovery of a lifetime. This treasure is going to change his life. He's not going to have to work like he works now for the rest of his life. The problem is he doesn't own the field, therefore he doesn't own the treasure. And so as the parable goes, he hides it again, looks around, no one sees what's going on. He buries it back in the field and then he goes about trying to secure the funding to buy this field. He will pay whatever price the owner of the field wants. Now the reason here as to why this treasure has been abandoned or, or hidden and, and the owner hasn't come back to find it is unclear, except that in those days they didn't have the banking establishments and the banking economies that we're accustomed to in our day and our age. So if you had great possessions, if you had much wealth uh, of a monetary value, of a metal, metallurgy value, and you wanted to keep them safe, the earth was considered probably the safest place where you could keep it, except that sometimes Sometimes someone would forget exactly where the X is that marks the spot. Or maybe, maybe a new invading nation comes in and takes this, this landowner, uh, this treasure owner, away in captivity or is exiled. Or maybe the person dies before revealing where the treasure is to their family. Whatever the reason might be, this person has hidden their treasure in the earth because they thought it would be the safest place for them to hide it. The problem was, for whatever reason, they've moved on, they've forgotten, they no longer are in possession of that field. Some other lucky person comes along and discovers this treasure, this great wealth. So, coming back to our man, he buries it again, he hides it up, no one knows the value of that field except maybe for its farming potential. The owner of the field simply sees it as a way to get rental income. The man approaches the, the owner of the field and says to him, I want to buy the field. He says, well, here's the price. The man says, no problem, I will find that price. He goes around, he borrows, he begs, he steals. Well, maybe he doesn't steal, but he tries to get money from his family. His family thinks he's lost his mind. I mean, he's not even paying possibly market value for the land. Maybe he's willing to overpay for that land because the man who owns the field doesn't really want to sell, so he gets to name his price. And so the rest of the world is watching this man frantically go about trying to raise the funds that he needs, uh, using all of what he has in his possession as collateral, borrowing from others, asking for help from others to buy this field that to the naked eye 
simply looks like a piece of land that you could lease for much less money and make your money off of the harvesting of the crops that you sow in the field. They don't understand his desperation. They don't understand his willingness to pay any amount of money to get this field. But the man does. The man knows what's in that field. He knows that the, the potential of that field is so much more than a lifetime of labor, a lifetime of hard work, a lifetime of sowing and reaping and harvesting. He knows that there is a treasure in that field, but he must own the land in order to own the treasure. And so he sets about by all means to accomplish this goal. And so he succeeds. He buys the field and now the treasure is his. Now, Jesus started off this parable by saying, the kingdom of God is like. So he wasn't actually concerned with economic gain and he wasn't actually concerned with the, with the regular customary practice of hiding something in the field. He wasn't talking about bank accounts and he wasn't talking about earthly wealth. He was talking about the kingdom of God and he used this object lesson that many of the people in the audience would understand, they would relate to because perhaps they had gone to this means to conceal their wealth. They knew that others had found treasures that hadn't been planted there by them because original owners had passed away or moved on and hadn't taken the treasure with them. And so Jesus latches onto this real life historical situation and he says, I want you to think about this in the same way that you would go to any economic means to obtain a field in which you knew there was something hidden that would be of far greater value than whatever you've paid for the field. That is what the kingdom of God is like. Now, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God, in essence, is Jesus Christ. He is the kingdom of God on earth, right? When Jesus came to this earth, he brought all of what heaven is with him in bodily form. Jesus was the original seed of the kingdom of God. He is also the summation of the kingdom of God. Jesus and the plan of salvation is the kingdom of God. The heavenly family above is part of the kingdom of God. And anybody who joins themselves to Christ and becomes part of the family of God is now a citizen of the kingdom of God, a part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in its entirety with Jesus as the pinnacle, with the gospel of salvation as the pinnacle, is the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying here is there is nothing on earth that compares to the wealth you will gain when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. With Him, you receive eternal time, eternal life. With Him, you receive victory over sin. With Him, you receive the promise of glory. With Him, you receive a new identity, a new family on earth, a family in heaven. With Him, you receive the promise of the resurrection from the dead. With Him, you receive health for your soul. You become a new creation, transformed and renewed in the very image of God. This is what is the benefit of being part of the kingdom of God and receiving the kingdom of God. So he says, what can you compare on earth? What, what would be worth the distraction that would take your mind and your heart and your focus off of the kingdom of God? Because in the words of Jesus in another place, he says, what, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <laughs> if you lose your soul to this world, if your ambitions alone are in this world, if your vision of kingdom building is the castles in the sand of this world, you are going to suffer eternal loss. And in that day, what would you be able to exchange to restore your soul? You have nothing that you can give in exchange for your soul. But the kingdom of God does, does have something. The kingdom of God gave Jesus in exchange for your soul. Jesus laid down his life that you might have his life. He took your death that you might have his life. It was the exchange of a lifetime. It was a once off for all time, for all people in all places, exchange of the infinite life of Jesus for your finite life. There is nothing you can give to exchange for your soul. And so if you do not receive the gift that the kingdom of God offers, the payment that God has made for your life, then there is nothing that will redeem your soul. The value of the kingdom of God is beyond anything this world offers you. This is why when Jesus was taken into the wilderness, led by the Spirit of God, and when the enemy came, when he was at his weakest point, with those three great temptations, we read about it in Luke chapter 4 and onwards, when, 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 when Jesus is confronted by the enemy, and the enemy says to him, you know what, just bow down before me, 
and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. Jesus says, no ways. Get away from me, Satan. The Lord God and him alone should we worship. Jesus says, I will not. I will not trade my soul, my eternity, and the eternity of those I've come to save for the short-term gain of all kingdoms of this world. And yet, there are human beings on this planet right now who are making that very exchange. No thought for eternal realities. No awareness of the importance of spiritual preparation. No belief in the coming kingdom of God in all its glory. No trust in the past arrival of the kingdom of God in the form of Jesus Christ. Completely oblivious, perhaps willingly oblivious, to the kingdom of God and its value. And the risk is eternal loss. Jesus says, there is nothing in this world that can compare to the value of your soul. There is nothing that can compare to the value of the kingdom of God. And there is nothing that you have that can obtain for you the kingdom of God, except that it is like a treasure buried in a field. It's yours for the finding. Isn't that great news? It's yours for the finding. The field is this book I'm holding. The field is the word of God. And in the word of God is buried the treasure of the kingdom of God. This is why Jesus said to the disciples and to the scribes and the Pharisees of his day, he said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but they are they which testify of me. Jesus is the great treasure of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. This is the field and the treasure can only be found by diligently searching. One of the things highlighted there is that the, the kingdom of God is worth any sacrifice you must make to obtain it. We call this in the language of the Bible, the cost of discipleship. And there is a cost to discipleship. The treasure is there. It's yours for the taking. In a sense, it's free in that you have not, you have not paid for it. But at the same time, you know, somebody else has, has, has gifted it to you. But at the same time, the cost... Is, is the willingness to lay down your life for the one who has first laid down his life for you. It is the path of willing, chosen obedience. It is, the, it is the forsaking of the past and the turning towards something new. It is the exercise of the will, the exercise of the choice to receive it, to walk in the footsteps of the master and, and to have the world look at you like you're a foreigner and an alien. It's, it's the reality that if you choose to align yourself with the kingdom of God, your values will change. The things you find important will be different. What you live for will be altered. And it will make you look different and strange to the world around you. It will cut across your sinful, uh, your sinful nature and your, and your sinful desires. It will call for change. It's not a change you effect in your own strength. It's not a change you have the power to accomplish in your own strength. But it is a change nonetheless that will happen because when you receive the kingdom of God, when you search these pages, when you uncover the value of it, when you adopt it, when you receive it, of course you will live differently. This is why this man, this man who, who found this treasure, he, he went to every length possible to make sure that he secured it. No expense was too great. The cost of discipleship in the language of the kingdom, the cost of discipleship, although we would look at it and say there's a cost because of the, what we will lose by worldly acclaim and perhaps by worldly opportunity and perhaps by, by in the estimation of the eyes and the opinion of others, perhaps others will not regard us as altogether sane. They will perhaps look at us and our reputation might be tarnished or whatever the case may be. We may lose standing in the eyes of this world or standing us in the eyes of this world, those, those costs of discipleship are a very small price to pay when you realize how valuable what God is offering you is. He's giving you back your soul from sin. He's giving you eternity in His presence. He's giving you victory over this world and over its brokenness and over its sin. He's giving you Himself in the person of Jesus. When you understand the value of the kingdom of God, there is no cost of discipleship that will be counted too high to obtain that treasure. Because everything you think is a loss in following Christ are the things that was going to cost you eternal life 
anyway. Everything you think you're paying for the kingdom of God is actually a blessing in that it was holding you back before. So ultimately, ultimately, what you think is a cost, what you think is a liability, is actually a gain and an asset for this life and for eternity. The treasure is in the field. It's yours for the taking. If you will diligently seek it, if you will go for it, if you will, if you will find it, it's there. It is there if you will have it. Now, think about this. Think about this. What are the things that get in the way of us really discovering this kingdom of God in this field of God's word? It would be the things that distract us from devoting the time and the energy to the searching of the field. I mean, you know, sometimes there are good things. It could be, for instance, our educational pursuits. You know, the, the, the study journey that we go on in a secular sense, the university, uh, the university season of our life where we are training for our, our, our vocation for the rest of our lives, right? The, the hard work that we put in there can be, can be a distraction. If we are neglecting the searching of this word, and I'm not against the, that so-called higher education, I'm not against getting a university degree and get specialized training, not against that at all. But the two risks in that area and in that season of life, number one, is that we allow it to, 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 to suck up all the time, to, to take away all the, the time that should be devoted, at least in part, to the search of God's word, to the focus on the kingdom of God. And the second way that it can harm us is that oftentimes we come to regard the learned men and women of the world, our professors, the authors of the books we read and we study, as of having greater weight than the Word of God. And when we come into a, you know, disagreement between the Word of God and these learned people with these letters behind their names, that sometimes we will choose their explanations of life, their explanations on, on the origins of this world and the origins of mankind, their explanations on how life works and the psyche of mankind and, and the priorities of man and all that kind of stuff. We may end up leaning upon worldly wisdom out of esteem for these learned men of the world instead of instead of trusting the Word of God. And hey, it's not just, it's not just higher education and, and, and the studying of, of books that contradict Scripture that can be a distraction from the kingdom of God, from, from searching the field to obtain the kingdom of God. I want to suggest to you that even religion itself, even church itself, can be a distraction. When church applies its layers of tradition over the teachings of the Word of God, when we trust to the traditions of the church, to the, to, to the way things have always been done or the things that have always been taught instead of getting our cues from the Word of God, studying what the Word of God says, letting it stand for itself. We can obscure the truth and the beauty of the kingdom of God by religion, by religious tradition, by the way things have always been done through time and through eternity, right? We can allow religion itself to obscure and the false teachings of religion to obscure what the Word of God says. And hey, it's not only philosophy and education and, and religion that can get in the way. We can allow business to get in the way. The bottom line is anything that absorbs our time, our energy, and our focus so that we have nothing left to give to searching the field of God's Word for the Kingdom of God, or anything that we place of higher value or that we'll place our trust in uh, of more significance than what we find in the Word of God when, when it seems like these two worlds, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world and its traditions and its teachings collide. Anything that gets in the way of giving priority to the kingdom of God is something that could cost us our eternal life. And those are the very things that are being highlighted here in this language of this man going out and, and doing whatever it takes to obtain the kingdom of God. If you need to sacrifice some study time, some work time, if you need to shed the religious traditions, then do that. Let the word of God speak for itself. Make time to search and to, and, and to discover the kingdom of God. Let nothing get in the way and distract you from the kingdom of God. Okay, going on from there, there's another story. It follows immediately in verse 45 of Matthew chapter 13. It says, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Okay, you think to yourself, this sounds very similar, but there is a subtle difference. The man who found the treasure in the field found it accidentally. He didn't know it was there. Hey, he wasn't even searching for it, to be brutally honest. He was happy and content to go about his daily life just earning a meager living, right? And then he found something. He stumbled upon it. This is a group of people who, who, who they, you know, they, they don't even know what they're missing. But one day, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, through the, the, the providences of God, they discover the kingdom of God. They discover Jesus Christ, the king of the kingdom of God. And they didn't even know that's what they were looking for. They didn't even know that's what they needed. But then there's another class of people. They have that sense that, 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 that something's amiss. They have that sense that there's something greater. They have that sense that they need to move towards discovering. They, they're, they're intentionally searching for truth and for righteousness. This is like the merchant man. He is a connoisseur of valuable things. He is accustomed to valuable things. In the, in, in the language of the parable here, this is his trade. This is his business. He's used to uh, buying and selling and finding valuable things and, and, and investing in still greater things that are of still more value, right? But he knows that he hasn't quite found that one thing that would trump them all. And this is the language here. He goes out searching. He doesn't know what it is, but when he finds it, he will know. It's that sense. When I see it, I'll know, right? And so he goes out there intentionally, deliberately. Unlike the man who finds the treasure in the field who, who finds it accidentally. This man is a seeker. He thirsts for something better. He desires and he has a sense that there is something better and he is looking for it. He tries here and he tries there. He trades this and he trades that. This philosophy, that practice, this spirituality, none of it, none of it, none of it really is the thing. Until one day he discovers the kingdom of God and the king of the kingdom. He deliberately searches and is found by the kingdom, the pearl of great price. And you know what? When he finds it, he gives up everything else. He gives up all that philosophy. He gives up all that other alternative spirituality. He gives up all the, the things of the world. He gives it all up. He even gives up his own sinful desires because he has found the thing that will satisfy for eternity. He has found that thing that is of greater value than anything else. And he trades everything for it. He is a seeker. He is a searcher. And now that he lays his eyes on the kingdom of God, he knows that thing he couldn't articulate, that thing he couldn't quite, uh, just was, was on the tips of his fingers. Now he has grasped it. And all that other stuff now is rubbish. He trades it all for this one thing. Friend, I want to suggest to you that is Jesus Christ. When you discover him, when you realize the sacrifice that he has made, when you realize the love that he has for you, when you realize the way that he looks upon you with favor and with compassion, when, when you realize that no matter how far you've fallen and wherever you've gone in this world, whatever variety of spirituality you've tasted, whatever you've sold your soul to in the hopes that it would make you rich, when you turn to him, you realize that all is forgiven, reconciliation is offered, you belong to him. You always have belonged to him. And now you have been found by him. <laughs> I love these stories. I love these stories of this, this hidden treasure, this pearl of great price. It tells me that, they, that, that when I think in my head, when I think and feel in my heart that the cost is too great, it really isn't. All that that reveals is that I don't understand the value of what has been offered to me in Jesus Christ. Again, the words of Jesus, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's nothing you can give, but there is one who has given himself for you. You see, to be, to be almost but not wholly saved is to be not almost but wholly lost. Do I need to say that again? To be almost but not wholly saved is to be not almost but wholly lost. 
There are many, there are many who, who are on the verge of, of receiving the kingdom of God. They see Jesus, they see the wonders, the conviction settles upon their hearts, but they still count the cost too high. If that's you, friend, I want to say to you, whatever the cost is, it's worth the price you think you will pay. Because all that's happening in your head and heart right now is you are not truly comprehending the value that there is in eternal life, the value that there is in Jesus Christ. If you think that the price is too high, it's not too high. Your heart is in a state of deception. You are blinded to the value of what's being offered you. If I, if I came to a child and I offered them a $5 note or a, or a coin jar filled with one cent pieces, if there were still such a thing as one cent pieces, and that coin jar didn't even total $5 in value, most children, most children not understanding what that $5 piece of paper, plasticky money thing represents, would probably choose this great big treasure of coins. It looks greater, it looks better. That jar, that coin jar, that represents the world, friend. It's not nearly as valuable as the note, as the check that's been written in your behalf in the blood of Jesus. And like children sometimes, we are willing to give up what is truly of greater value to pursue that which seems to be of value, but in reality it isn't. There are many of us who have counted the cost of discipleship and we think the cost is too high. We're holding off. For instance, there was a group of people in Jesus' day. Some of the Pharisees, in fact, they were under conviction. They knew. The Bible tells us that they, that they later on, in fact, after the resurrection of Jesus, they converted and they gave their lives to following Jesus. And during His earthly ministry, they, they saw the miracles. They heard the teaching. They were tired of formal religion. They wanted something better. But because of the opinion of others, because of the way it would look, because of how it might damage their reputation and their standing in the church or their standing in their religious society, they would not acknowledge Him openly. How many of us are like that? How many of us, because we're afraid of what our family is going to call us, or what our family might do to us, or, 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 or what our friends might think of us, how many of us, we know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We are sure that He is what we want, and yet our pride and our reputation, our love of this world, our preoccupation with, 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 with our education, with our jobs, with our pursuit of financial wealth, or maybe even the cherishing of our sin is holding us back from making that all-out commitment to Jesus Christ. Remember this little slogan, he who is almost but not wholly saved is certainly not almost but wholly lost. To see and to be convicted is almost there. The kingdom of God is at our fingertips, but we must surrender. How many of us fail to receive the treasure? Because as we, as we search the field, we find that the teachings of the kingdom, the values of the kingdom, the person of the kingdom cut across our sinful tendencies and our cherished sinful desires. And we, we, we want it, but, but just not quite enough because we're still, we're still in love with our old way and our old life. Friend, let me tell you, what will you give one day in exchange for your soul? There will be nothing unless you accept the exchange that Jesus has provided in His life, His death, and His resurrection. The kingdom of God is of greater value than any perceived or real price that you think you will have to pay to receive the kingdom and its king. You will have a new life. You will have new power. You will have new friendship, new reconciliation. You will have new promise and new hope for the future. You will have a new eternity and a new identity. And yes, you may suffer loss, but you will gain inestimably more than what you will lose. It is the treasure hidden in the field. Search for it with all of your time and all of your energy. It is the pearl of great price 
that thing you have been searching for, that, that hankering for something better inside of your soul, that, that urge that the Holy Spirit has placed there that drives you to seek and to search, Jesus Christ is that treasure. He is the pearl of great price. And He is yours for the taking. And the only cost is that all-out surrender to the one who has already laid down his life for you. You see, when you receive him at cost, you know, to, this, to the things of this world and the ambitions and whatever else, that cost of discipleship, when you receive him at perceived cost, don't forget the incredible cost that he has gone to to make himself available. And what you are, as it were, paying giving up to receive Him, you remember that that is only the response awakened by the much greater gift that He has first given to welcome you back. You are His pearl of great price and He is your pearl of great price. He has come searching for you and you are invited to search and receive Him. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. I hope that today you will not delay. I hope that today you will realize that there is no price too great to pay and that a far greater price has been paid by heaven to reconcile with you. Honor the sacrifice of heaven by making whatever sacrifice you need to make to receive that gift. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I ask for the person who's hearing this, who have seen this picture of the kingdom of God that you've outlined in Scripture here. I pray that they will, I pray that their heart will respond. I pray that you will be found by them. I pray, Lord, that you will bring peace and joy and love and all the fruits of the Spirit into their life. I pray that they will see themselves through new eyes, through your eyes. Their identity will be reframed. I pray, Lord, that you would fill them with the hope of the kingdom, the anticipation of your soon return. And I pray, Lord, that you will compel them and drive them to keep searching this field for the kingdom of God, that they may know it more fully and experience it more fully, that they may treasure this pearl of great price, and that you and they would be eternally reconciled. In Jesus' name, amen.